spring is in the air. The days are lengthening, the sap is rising. Photographs of spring flowers blooming in coloured carpets in Namaquiland have flooded social media here in South Africa. In the spirit of not enoughness, which characterises our culture, some of these photographs have been photoshopped to dial up their intensity. Fake nature. What an oxymoron. But still, here they are once again. Flowers bursting forth, bright new leaves on winter branches. In the most vibrant shade of green they will ever inhabit. Spring feels like such a joyful invitation to embrace the new, the vibrant, the light. After months of winter darkness, spring gives us hope that new growth, transformation and rebirth are possible. And hope is so necessary and persistent. The pandemic is still with us, but we can hope that the worst of the dark clouds will somehow be pushed away by the messenger god, known as Hermes by the Greeks or Mercury by the Romans. And Mercury is the scantily clad, good-looking lad we see on the left edge of Botticelli's huge painting, La Primavera, Spring. Mercury is super nonchalant about his physicality and is not distracted in the slightest by the nymph, the goddesses, or indeed by the three graces cavorting behind him. He's too busy shooing away the dark storm clouds of winter off the top left edge of the picture with his staff. His back turned to the various guises of female springtime awakenings. Could Mercury be a portrait of Botticelli's art patron who commissioned the work? Or possibly a self-portrait of the artist himself? We will never know. What is documented is that throughout his life, Botticelli remained single and was disinterested by in women. He was anonymously reported to the authorities for sodomy, but cleared of the charges. Leonardo da Vinci wasn't so lucky. He actually did some jail time on similar charges. Botticelli was seven years older than Leonardo and can therefore be regarded as the bridge between the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. He seems mildly interested in Neoplatonic philosophy, but he's certainly no intellectual, and perspective isn't such a great concern of his either. He gives us a token nod to aerial perspective in the minuscule glimpse of a distant landscape in between the trees behind Mercury. Space in this huge painting, measuring about three meters by two, is quite flat, very similar to one of those medieval tapestries called Mi Fleur, or A Thousand Flowers, which adorned the walls of the wealthy palazzos of Florence at the time. The size of the flowers on the ground remains the same regardless of distance. And the central figure is further up on the picture plane, so further away from the viewer, and yet she's the same size as the other ones. Leonardo da Vinci was more inquisitive and exacting. He studied space, optics and perspective in order to feed them into his painting practice. Actually, Leonardo didn't like Botticelli at all. But then he didn't like Michelangelo either, who was also gay and another professional rival. Typical behavior in the art world. Nothing much has changed since then. 
As the title of this painting suggests, La Primavera is an allegory about the season of spring, but the exact message being conveyed is unclear as Botticelli has taken liberties, using a mixed bag of references, metaphors, symbols and stories. Greek and Roman myths and goddesses and the Virgin Mary are all on the stage together. The painting reads right to left, which is slightly counterintuitive. Perhaps Botticelli, like Leonardo, was also left-handed. Starting from the right then, we see Zephyrus, the west wing of spring, who, according to the cardinal points, should be coming from the left, not the right, attempting to seduce the nymph Chloris by breathing all over her. Obviously not a time of a pandemic here. This big sigh of desire seems to alarm the nymph who, in her attempt to escape his clutches, loses her balance and almost falls. At this point, nature comes to her rescue. Flowers spring from her mouth, a floral scream that transforms her into Flora, the Roman goddess of spring. In her new persona, she is no longer skimpily dressed in diaphanous clothing, but is now seen fully composed in a floral frock. And she's no longer frightened, but poised and smiling as she dips her hand into the folds of her dress, ready to sprinkle her flowers everywhere. And indeed, the, the ground is covered in them. There are around 138 different plants in the painting, including forget-me-nots, irises, ranunculi, carnations, fleur-de-lis, poppies, daisies, pansies and jasmine blossoms. It is a celebration of the bounty of nature. But these flowers indicate more than the renewal of seasons. Their meaning can vary based on whether they are placed in a pagan or a Christian context. Carnations, daisies and jasmine blossoms are symbolic of love and matrimony. Poppies represent prosperity and fertility. There's also hellebore said to be the harbinger of eternal youth which can also heal the insanity brought about by unrequited love. Oranges and orange blossoms, which we see in the trees of the grove, also symbolize matrimony, as Juno offered them to Jupiter as marriage dowry. This is quite a spread for all these bare feet to tread on. So we see womanhood depicted here in three different states, from the chastity of nymphhood, victim of unwanted male sexual advances, to the abundant pleasures of Flora, goddess of spring, to the beauty of the central figure, head tilted, who is supposed to be Venus, goddess of love, but who looks suspiciously like a bride or a Virgin Mary. But Aphrodite, or Venus to the Romans, never married and was certainly not a virgin. But never mind. Who cares who she really is? She is the tamed version of lust. Beauty personified dressed in a red robe that catches the eye, framed by an arch formed by the dark silhouettes of, th of tree branches. She stands out because of the stark contrast of colour against dark background, a trick worth remembering. Moving on, in case we hadn't got the entangled references, we see the, the three graces, beauty, 
pleasure and chastity, according to the Roman version of the Greek myth. Dancing in a self-obsessed threesome as the figure of Cupid floats above the scene, about to shoot an arrow at one of them. If Cupid to the Romans, Eros to the Greeks, or love to us, targets chastity with his arrow, its impact will result in marriage. A socially acceptable context to control beauty and tame pleasure. Or some such story prevailing in a 15th century medieval patriarchal culture. That being said, despite or maybe even because of the confusion of references, La Primavera has a wonderful playfulness and lightness about it bordering on irreverence for past traditions, which have made it one of the most popular and forever young paintings of all times. You don't really need to know who's who in the scene. It's an open-ended tableau with no single narrative. Perhaps someone is getting married. It is said that the painting may have been a wedding present of sorts, commissioned by the most powerful and wealthy family in Europe at the time, the Medicis. They were enlightened bankers who, luckily for us, splurged on the arts. Without them, the Renaissance would not have happened in quite the same way. Regardless of such factual details, we now have this visual celebration of all things associated with spring. The weather is kind. Bare feet dance on new grass and blossoms. Beauty and sexual awakening are all present here. This is the first time in art history that such a large scale painting is depicting not a biblical story, but a pagan one. This is not a stuffy sermon, but an open air celebration. Through the ambiguity of the central figure, the pagan religion of the ancients is reconciled with Christianity. And perhaps one could say that with Mary taking over the reins from Venus, this patriarchal view of the female extremes of either virgin or whore has haunted women ever since. Today we know that the roles women play, the archetypes they embody, are far more complex and layered than that. So this painting opens quite a few doors for today's art process. For myself, from my standpoint, 550 years after this was painted, I can choose to disregard Botticelli's ignorance and biases around issues of femininity and just absorb the contagious lightness of the painting. Notice the device of colour against darkness, the surprising and touching homage Botticelli pays to the multiplicity of the floral kingdom and enjoy the painting's underlying message of hope, rebirth and transformation. I am also reminded of my own transformation from girlhood to womanhood, transitioning through different roles and adapting to different seasons geographical locations and circumstances in one way or another. Transformation and rebirth are vital ingredients to hold on to at all times, but especially now in the middle of a pandemic. In years to come, people may look back and refer to this time as the Great Transformation. Transformation is what allows Chloris to turn fear into flowering, 
an opportunity for growth. To move beyond her traumatic encounter with Zephyr and to undergo a metamorphosis from innocent victim falling over herself to a more self-aware young woman who can graciously stand her ground while making everything around her blossom.